Welcome to another Light Blade Learning Lab. Um, today I'm cuddling a pile of uh, corrugated cardboard because I've got a real job to do and I'm going to use it as a demonstration piece for you guys because corrugated cardboard is not quite as simple to cut as you might think. The problem is this is what they call triwall. It's basically three pieces of cardboard and two layers of corrugation. There are two major problems when you cut cardboard. The biggest problem is the air gap that's between the sheets. Now what happens is the first layer burns, produces smoke. That smoke absorbs energy and it makes it more difficult to pierce through the second layer. But when it pierces through the second layer, there's even less energy and more smoke in this cavity beneath that to try and get out the bottom layer. Now to try and overcome that you put lots of power into it. The problem is the more power you put into it the more likely you are to actually set fire to the gases that are between these layers. And so you know you actually are fighting all sorts of problems when you cut corrugated cardboard. Now there is a technique that I'm going to show you later on for cutting this and other difficult materials. But in the first instance, what we're going to do is try and do it by conventional means. We're going to do just a straightforward cut with air assist. And we'll see what sort of results we get. It's basically a four piece assembly packing kit. Right, it assembles together as a little module like that, but it will be supplied flat pack. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about the design principles behind this. Yeah, I know it's very simple, but there are ways that you can cut it and ways that you can cut it. Now the obvious way to cut these would be as four separate pieces. No, that's not the clever way to cut it. Well here in RD Works I've imported a DXF file from my CAD system where I have designed this piece in a certain way. Now I'm just going to show you that that is one object. These are all single objects. OK, so the slots are one object and then we've got that line there, that line there, that line there. And although you can't see it, if you look carefully, you'll see that at that point there, there's a break. That's a separate line. And then when I touch on the outside, you'll see that the outside is also a continuous line. And although we've got one, two, three, four pieces here, I've linked them all together. And if you look, they've got little gaps in the lines. And those gaps in the lines will hold the pieces together after they've been laser cut. So this will finish up as one single piece, which the client will then break up into four pieces and assemble. But it's a flat pack, one piece cut. Now, if we take a look at this point here in the middle, which is a single little uh, V shape, um, you'll see that that's an element on its own. I'll pick up that line, hold down my shift key, pick up that line there and this line here. So those three lines along there will be a group. This little piece here I shall leave alone and these I shall put these into a group as well the four slots group. So now there aren't many parts to order. So we'll go to this section here and we'll decide how we want to cut these. Well I think the first thing that we'll do is probably cut that line there. And then we'll cut this bit here and then we'll cut the set of boxes here and then we'll do the lines along the middle and then we'll do the outside and there we go that's all ordered now having ordered that one put a handle around here and I could do copy but I'm going to do control C which is the same thing in Windows and then I'm going to place my arrow down here and I'm going to press control V. Okay, now I'll put a box around there and I will move that to there. 
Now that I go to this order section, I find it hasn't got about four items in it or five items in it. It's got ten items in it. Because what's actually happened is whatever I produced in this first copy has been copied down with this second copy. So the ordering remains the same in both copies. And we can prove that. And it's a useful trick to know because it means you only have to program one of them. So when we go into this mode here, you'll see that it's producing them exactly as I want them with the slots, then the line down the middle, then the outside. And then it'll produce the line, the big, this line down here, then the little piece, then the slots. Line along the middle and the outside. So what it's done, it's done a complete replication, including the ordering, which is a very useful trick to remember. Now we'd normally cut this, so we'll cut it at something like about 25 millimeters a second and probably 50% power. These are just numbers at the moment. Um, we'll go out on the machine and we'll find out the right settings because I want to, I want to show you something in particular. Now, from previous experience, I know that we need quite a lot of air underneath the job to extract the fumes. Now, <clears throat> the problem with a honeycomb bed, which is probably what most people would use, is two things. First of all, you'll get marks on the back of your job. And secondly, there is not very much airflow through a honeycomb bed. The air disappears down the side and not underneath the job, which is where you want to do most of the extraction. So you've either got to do something like this. You've got to put spaces underneath your job so that you can get air underneath it, cross flow air. Or in this particular instance, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using my pin tables. I, put, now I don't need too much support, but I should need I should need maybe five or six pins in each one of these. Now the pins pass right the way through and they sit on the bed underneath. So I'm going to put four pins in there. Four pins in there. And just because I've got spare pins, I'll put one in the middle of each one. I'll make it five. They're reasonably flat. I've got a two-inch lens in, so I've got a reasonable amount of compliance that I can work with. Now, I've got quite a lot of tolerance on here, but I will set it reasonably close to the back of the card. I want you to see what's going on underneath that card. Now I've got too much power on there, so I could go faster. But hey, look. We have a problem, Houston. classic example of what can happen when you start trying to cut corrugated cardboard. So I know I was running at full power, but you can see here the marks on the surface of my acrylic. That tells me I've got far too much power because I'm actually cutting into the surface of the acrylic as well. So I've got too much power to do the job or conversely I can go a lot faster. Well, at the moment, I'm running this job at 25 millimetres a second of 50% power. So let's try running it something like about 40 millimetres a second and see what happens. Now, I'm going to use this same piece of card because I know that I can use this bottom section here. OK, so this time we're running at 40 millimetres a second. <laughs> We 
We've still got too much power. So maybe I can go even faster. We'll just cut this one out. And just check that it doesn't catch fire. It's on the verge of. No, as it goes along. Look at it. So here we are, attempt number one. Cut cleanly. It's not a bad cut. But look what's on the back. We've still got smoke marks on the back. And basically what that is, there's those smoke that's coming from the burning of these that's getting underneath it's pooling up underneath because I haven't got the door closed, I haven't got a, tr a good through flow of air and it's pooling up underneath and it's burning. Now if you were using a if you were using a honeycomb bed you would get lots of these pools of gas collecting underneath the job and the chances are you'd have a lot more marks than this. These are only just little marks caused by the gas escaping at this point here. So that's the job, and that's how the job is presented to the client. Now all he has to do is to break this like this, and like that, and like that, and then just assemble together like that. So that's the job, and as you can see, that was pretty successful. Except, we nearly set fire to the place. We could try going faster, and we will try that on the next one, because there will be some settings that we could use to make this work. But it's always a serious risk of fire, because you've got the power on continuously. Well, we've really pushed the boat out this time. We've gone up to 60 millimetres a second, 50% power. Now 50% power is about 52 watts, but of course that's 52 watts at the tube, not down here. So the chances are, if we assume that we're losing 20%, 2 fives is 10, we've probably got 40 watts down here. We've got splashes at the corners, which is where it slows down. But there's not enough flame there, long enough, to do any damage. Now, as we get towards the end here, you'll see smoke coming out of the end of the corrugations. And sometimes you can just see a little puff of smoke and a flame coming out of the end as well. So you might see it coming out this end here, a little puff of flame. No, it's not close enough to the end. Slightly overstepped the mark there, haven't we? It will push out, we shall be able to use it, but it's right on the edge of, of working. But look, we're still producing burn marks underneath flames. You can see the smoke marks. And we've gone as fast as we can and we're still not cutting. So this just reinforces the point I made to start with. You have to have a lot of power to cut through. But of course, on the corners, when the speed slows down, there is enough energy to pierce through and then we get this smoke coming out and we get local flaming and burning underneath these corner points. What I'm saying to you is here, this is, relatively speaking, a risky operation to, to carry out. There are other ways that we could try and tackle this problem. We could try and put a minimum speed in here as well. Using max and min is an art in itself. You have to understand what you're doing and it's not a simple matter of saying, well, I'll decrease the minimum to say 20% and I'll leave the max at 50%. 20 and 50 might work. There is a very, very narrow band where you can get the corners the same width, the same strength of power as you get the cut. So at the moment, we've gone too fast with our cut here because it's not very, um, I, mean, I can use this one. I mean, they will push out. 
Now, the other thing that you've got to be very careful of is these pieces. This is flammable material. And you've seen what happens. We can quite easily, when we've got excess power coming through, we could easily set fire to these pieces that are sitting underneath here. So we've got to make sure we keep our bed scrupulously clean. OK, so here's the alternative way that we're going to try and achieve this. First of all, we're going to set up some tests. So I've just drawn a little 25mm test square and we are this time going to set the parameters to blowing, yes, uh, output, yes, rather, speed, who knows. We'll start off at 20 millimetres a second and blowing, yes, but this time the processing mode is something called DOT and we'll run it at low power, 15% power, max and min. And now down here we've got these dotting times, which are quite important. Well, these are these are critical features. And what I would suggest you do is start off at 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. We don't know what they should be, but let's just see what happens with those numbers. Okay. So we've pushed the power right up to 50%. Now that same 50% power that we were using on, <laughs> that we were burning the other one up with, has produced a lovely clean cut with no marks on the back and no scorching in between. So, so let's double the speed to 40 millimetres a second. It hasn't made it through. It's made it through on the corners, but not along there. OK, so we've now got this next one set to 78% power, which is full 60 watts, and we're running it at 40 millimetres a second. So it's still not slow. Now previously, this would have set fire to the place. Still not cut through, so we're going too fast. To be honest, there isn't a lot of difference between 50% and 70% and 78%. Just a hint. So really we may as well not thrash the machine to death. We may as well keep it at 50%. Well our next step is to run at 50% power. So we've dropped the power back down again because that didn't seem to be doing a lot for us. And now we've dropped the speed to 30 millimetres a second. And we're very nearly there. We've got the other factors to play with. We're nearly breaking through, so we'll find out what these other factors do. Now the first thing we've done, we've put the dot time up from 0.1 to 0.2. So technically we've doubled the amount of power that we're putting into every dot. It's, it's nearly there, but then again so is that one. So doubling the time is not really doing a lot for us. So we might as well keep the time at 0.1 of a second per dot. We've now increased the dot length to 0.2. So that seems to have worked quite well. So 0.2 is a critical, not 0.2, the dot length itself is a critical factor. Let's just see whether we can push it out to 0.3. Now that has worked quite well, and what I'm going to do is this test, rub that along the edge, and as you can see we've got quite a lot of black marks, so we'll push that back to point two. Well, did you see the flame coming out the end there? And this time we'll do our test. Do another one on a different side. Still got a little bit of mark there. Let's compare that with point one.
point one didn't quite come out, but point one produces much cleaner edges. There's hardly any scorching on those at all, charring. I've now dropped the dot interval itself down so we get a few more dots. 0 0.07 as opposed to 0 0.1. And there we are, we've got a nice clean dropout now. And that's just by dropping down the interval. Wow, that's had an effect on the cleanliness of the edge as well. Now I've pushed the interval down to 0 0.05, so we've got a lot more um, dots. But the speed is still the speed. And I've pushed the speed up to 35 millimetres a second. nearly but not quite. Here we are back at one of our best results. So the dot interval was 0.07, the speed is 30, the dot time is 0.1 and the dot length is 0.1. And there we go, it just fell out more or less, just the merest touch and it fell out and that's perfectly clean. So what we're going to do at 30 millimetres a second, we're going to run our program. And here's what we finished up with for our cardboard. This material that I've got in the background here, using as a table. Um, quarter inch thick, we managed to get away using the two inch focal length lens because it was only a quarter of an inch thick. Well, the nozzle would normally be set about seven millimetres above the work face. Well, I dropped it down to six millimetres, so that was minus one. Power, well, we were using 50% power, which is actually, very conveniently, 52 watts, um, just a coincidence. But if we take 20% off those to allow for mirror losses and lens losses, uh, two fives, 10, we've, we've brought it down to 40 watts at the, at the work face. And we had a dot time of 0.1, a dot interval of 0.07, we had a dot length of 0.1 and we were using maximum air assist because we were trying to keep the smoke blown out of the way. Um, we were using the steel table and we were using the pin bed. We were running at 30 millimetres a second and there are some notes here, don't leave the machine unattended. Uh, you've seen what happens when you run it in normal mode not dot mode, but I still would not trust it, even in dot mode. And it's important that after every cycle you clear your debris away. Well again, we use full extraction and you could see clearly when we looked underneath the work the importance of having cross flow to take the smoke clean away. So there's our old drawing, which was previously on a cut layer. We're going to change the speed to 30. We're going to change the process to dot and we're going to leave the power at 50-50. The dot time is 0.1, the dot interval is going to be 0.07 and the dot length is going to be 0.1. Now I'll just let you see this one running and then any others I'm going to um, close the lid. It's clearing away very nicely under there. And there's our job. All the pieces are going to fall out nicely. And there we go. 
not a hint of burning on the back and also pretty clean on the edges as well make sure we clear our debris away okay so we're going to use our 25 millimeter test square again to try and find the right parameters for cutting polystyrene again we'll set this fairly low at something like maybe 20 percent and we'll set the speed mm, quite high at maybe 25 millimeters a second because it's a very soft flammable material output yes blowing yes remember what we started off with last time point 0.1 point 0.1 and point 0.1 they're always a set of good parameters to start with well who but me would be stupid enough to try and cut a piece of 28 mil thick polystyrene on a laser machine you use a hot wire cutter well to tackle the next problem I'm stupidly going to try and achieve I'm going to do something I never thought I would do which is to use a four inch lens in this particular case I think it's the only solution well there's the result on the front let's have a look on the back wow now that is not bad so apart from a little corner holding it in That is not half bad. The hole is actually better than the plug. Question is, can we get it any better? Still not bad. I think the original one, which is 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, was probably the best. So it's a speed of 5, a power of 12 and 12, a dot time of 0 0.6, a dot interval of 0 0.6, and a dot length of 0.6. We've got virtually no air assist in, but just a little bit. And yes, that's the best. Now what you will see in there, if we look carefully, lots of little strings, little joints, where we've actually joined the pulses together. But it takes but a little press and they all pop out. And that I think is the squarest, cleanest combination that we can get. We haven't set fire to anything because there's been no sustained energy it's just been pulses and that's the key to this process well here are the settings we finished up with for polystyrene um, <clears throat> basically we finished up using the four inch lens now normally the offset uh, the distance between the workpiece and the lens is about six millimeters so we set the lens down about three millimeters so there was a three millimeter gap so that's what the minus three is we were down three millimeters below where we would normally be power we used was 12 percent 12 percent now that was equivalent to six watts and assuming that we lose about 20 percent um, about two yeah, we lose it somewhere between one and a half and two watts. I've generously said the work face power was five watts. So as you can see, it was an incredibly low power required to cut polystyrene. We had a dot time of 0.6 seconds. We had a dot interval of 0.6 millimeters and a dot length of 0.6 millimeters. Now, when it came to air assist, we had a very, very small amount of air on. We were more than just the lens protection we were actually low flow we were using our steel table 
we'll be using the pin bed. Well, now we're going to be really silly and we're going to do something that is, I'm sure, impossible. But let's give it a go. And that is 50mm DPE foam. Well, they're 10 mil, so we've gone in one, two, three. We've gone in 30, 33 mil, and we're <laughs> we're not doing bad. Well, the good news is I can see fumes coming out the bottom. Well, we cut all the way through, but not necessarily prettily. But having said that. The hole is not bad, but the core is pretty crummy. So let's see what we can do now to tidy that up. <laughs> it's a bit tapered, but hey, the hole isn't. The hole is pretty... a little bit, but the hole at the bottom is nearly the same size as the hole at the top. Look at that, falling straight out. That's the size in the top. And the size in the bottom there is quite a bit bigger. There we go, it is possible to cut holes in PE foam. Now when it came to our most difficult challenge, which was polyethylene foam, which was 50 millimetres thick, we had to use the 4 inch lens. Um, normally it would be set about 6 millimetres above the work surface and we finished up setting it down by 3 millimetres so that it was 3 millimetres above the work surface. 25% power actually represents 33 watts, so if we lose 20% of that, that's about 6 watts. So we were down at work phase power of about 27 watts. Um, dot time 0.1, interval 0.2, dot length 0.3. We were using full air assist to try and stop the plastic from melting. Um, we were using our steel table to get cross flow and we were using the pin bed. Now the only comment that I would make was first of all we were going very very slow, very slow at two millimetres a second, um, but it was very smelly. I didn't like the smell of it and I certainly made sure I left the lid closed after the, I'd finished the cutting and I would at least 10 seconds to allow the fumes to clear. Well I think that turned out to be quite an interesting and at times exciting session. Obviously here I'm pushing things to the extreme but what I want to do is to prove to you that this machine is capable of doing some quite interesting things if you just explore some of its stranger points dot mode is one of those little known and stranger points. So until the next session, thanks for your time.